Let's get right to uh, chat with our friend, uh, State Senator Dave Severson, who's taking time out of his busy day to come on in. How are you? Doing great. It's always great to be on with you. Uh, we bumped into each other a week ago at a, at a get-together and said it's been too long since you've come in and, and, and hung out with us. And you were more than kind and said, well, let me know. I'm around. I'll, I'll come in. And and you did. And a fine member of your staff and I had a chat yesterday. Same woman you were telling me about the other night. Uh -huh. Who is uh, invaluable to you. Yeah, I am blessed to have a great team that helps because uh, you can't be everywhere all the time and so you have great staff that's there to take over to help uh fill those uh needs um just like you know the the president you know president can be successful if he surrounds himself with good and sharp and bright people and uh yeah, and a governor so yeah, that's where smart leaders know you surround yourself with smarter people and the 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 uh, political leaders know that you surround yourself with dumber people, so you look better. And so <laughs> I'd rather surround myself with smarter people that make me look good. Well, you, uh, if you have occasion to call Senator Severson's office, you will be treated very, very well from some knowledgeable and really nice people. So yeah, you have that going for you before you even pick up the phone. Yes, that's true. Thank you. Um, I, I mentioned to you, I, I got this thing in the mail. A bunch of other people did as well. Big, uh, colorful, loud. Uh, the new state beverage tax is a shock to the system. I'm supposed to call you and tell you to vote no on this. So I thought, you know, I'll just say it to you since you're here. Um, is this something we need to worry about? It's kind of a shock to the system. Yeah, No, it's not going to be something we have to worry about. We're not going to uh, uh, do that. Now, it's true that the state needs revenue. You know, after four years of the last, well, eight years of Bogoyevich and then eight years of Quinn, there is the the budget is a mess. The state is in debt. Uh, we still have a loss of jobs leaving Illinois, and we are working now in a bipartisan way in the Senate, not in the House with the Speaker, but in the Senate, to try to come up with a plan that can help move Illinois forward. And that includes a lot of tough things. It includes making cuts. It includes pension forms. It includes. Uh, uh, reforms to local government, allowing more consolidations of local government. There's procurement reform uh, in here, so it, you know, there's business for job reforms in here. But even when you do all that, the state is spending at such a level that uh, you cannot just cut your way out of it. There has to be some additional revenue. So what revenues are going to be looked at? Uh, it, some of those are putting the temporary tax back on uh, and the others is looking at do we do we tax do we broaden the sales tax base uh, do we put a junk food tax on what else do we do to help get the revenue uh, up uh, until the economy can grow uh, see m most of our spending is out of our control it's either federally mandated or it's debt payments or it's required pension payments and so even when we cut the areas we cut you just can't cut enough. Uh, uh, without to, to fill the rest of those needs. So until we can get the economy back on track, uh, there's going to have to be, unfortunately, some added revenue. And so the agreement worked out so far in the Senate is before we do the revenue increases, you have to do the cuts, uh, you have to do all the job reforms, you have to do the consolidation, you have to do the pension reforms. They have to be signed into law before uh, the revenue increases come in. So they're all locked together. Otherwise, it's the old scam, you know, we'll do this, but give us the tax increase first, the tax goes on, and then they never do the reforms. Right, right. And, and, and people are used to that being the way business goes. Well, give this to us now, and then we, we'll do the other things we have to. All right, well, here's the extra money. Which it's is what did. Quinn said, give, us the, give me this temporary tax, and I'm going to use that money to pay bills. He didn't pay one darn bill. Right. He just expanded government with it, and we're in a worse shape today. So we're saying under this, the cuts have to be made first, the pension reforms have to be made, consolidation has to be made first, uh, the job reforms have to be made first so we can stop the bleeding of companies out of Illinois. And once those are done, then we have proven to the taxpayers that we have made the tough decisions first, then we come back. Raising revenues ought to be the last resort, not the first resort. Spending some time with State Senator Dave Severson now, uh, pressed, uh, what do you support as far as shoring up some of these finances? Obviously, you're, you're behind. Let's cut and cut and get our, our house in order. The consolidation that you talked about, let's assume some magic wand is waved and agreements are made. What, what revenue enhancement do you look at first? Well, if we, if we have to do it, we have, we'll look at putting the temporary tax uh, back on. And it ought to be temporary again, so people can, so they can be held accountable for the money that they're spending. Uh, so that would be one. 
you know, the other is, you know, we have this crazy uh, tax on food system where most people don't even realize that certain food get taxed at a low price, some other foods get taxed at a high price, even certain shampoos get taxed at high and low. Tegrin medicated shampoo gets taxed at low tax, and Prell gets taxed at high tax. People don't know that uh, certain medicated lip gloss is low tax and other lip gloss is high tax. Let's just simplify it and just have one uh, one level tax for everyone. Uh, that's uh, that's an area that uh, I think would uh, would help raise some additional revenue. And along with that, what we want to do is if if the state is continues to put more into education, then there should be some relief back home. So part of our bill also uh, it, uh, puts into place at least a two year property tax freeze. So your property taxes can't go up for two years, maybe three, depending on how we how the numbers come in, and that'll give you know local taxpayers some breathing room from the. Uh, property taxes that continue to go up every single year. You know, with with, uh, with uh, the the, the Rauner Madigan dynamic. You know, we're into the second year of, of no budget. Somebody figured that. Uh, I think a lot of people figured that one person or the other would blink at this particular point. I think a lot of people were afraid that it would be Governor Rauner who would end up blinking. And uh, I don't know if you want to call it blinking, where he says he's willing to negotiate. It seems to me to be a reasonable measure, not not necessarily blinking. But Mike Madigan has not and will not budge. Is and you, you have an up close and personal picture of all this. I, I, am I off the mark in saying that? No, you're not. I've been there many years. I've been there through uh, I think five governors now, and uh, and uh, every governor ends up either blinking or going to jail because of you know Madigan. If you don't get along with him, there's consequences. And uh, uh, and then along comes Rauner, who says, you know. I got a billion dollars. I don't give a damn. I'm going to do what's best for Illinois. I'm not going to take a salary. I don't need this job. I'm going to do what's right, and you can't hurt me. And that's somebody that uh, Madigan's never come up against. Right. And so now we have a clash of of two individuals, which is a problem. And Rauner, to his credit, at the very beginning said the biggest problem Illinois has is we're number one in the nation with people leaving the state to find work. Uh, and he said, we have to turn our jobs climate around. So he introduced a series of bills two years ago that would turn Illinois around. And again, not ridiculous things. What he was talking about are the same things that Michigan, Ohio, Union States, uh, Indiana, uh, all have done to turn their states around. He introduces those, and Madigan says no. Uh, and then he starts compromising. So Rauner says, okay. I'll take right to work off the table. Okay, I'll take prevailing wage off the table. And Madigan says, well, still no. Uh, and so then he says, okay, I'll support putting revenue back on if we do these things. And Madigan says, still no, still no. Uh, and so I think what, what ends up is Madigan says the, the compromise is you, you do what I want to, you do exactly what I want to do, and that's a good compromise. Right. And We do things my way. And so the Senate Democrats have been frustrated with that too, saying hey, we can't continue down this path. And so in the Senate, we are working, and hopefully next week we'll move forward some of these reforms that we have negotiated. Again, a lot of them I'm not happy with, but a lot of them the Democrats aren't happy with either. Which is but, usually a sign of something that'll work. Sure, and the only way, and, and people say, oh, stick to your guns, don't do these things. Well, you have to remember, the Senate and the House are controlled by the Democrats. We cannot pass any piece of legislation unless the Democrats vote for it. So we're not Wisconsin, we're not Indiana, we're not Texas, so we have to get something that can actually pass the Democrats. So finding compromise is what we have to do, and so that's what we're looking to do with these series of bills that, that has all the different reforms that we've talked about, uh, and including the revenue. So if we can pass that bipartisanly out of the Senate, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the speaker and his members uh, to say to the speaker, hey, it's this is a compromise. Let's do this. There's plenty of time to worry about campaigns next year. I mean, we just finished the election. Let's put campaigning aside and let's turn Illinois around. And then there'll be plenty to argue about in the 2018 elections. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, as we said, the, the, the speaker does not seem to have any interest in this at all. And when you talk about outbound migration, people leaving Illinois, 
we lead the Midwest, and it isn't even close. I looked at a map that broke it down the other day. We've lost basically the equivalent of Peoria. Yeah, and what's interesting is people aren't leaving to go to warmer states. They're not no. leaving to go to, uh, you know, Texas. Which it's is retirement a time, and we're heading down. So they're not doing it. The number one state for Illinois jobs, the number one state is Indiana. Well, same climate that we have. Yep. Their schools aren't better. Their roads aren't better. So why are they going to Indiana? And the only reason is, is because the jobs climate is better. When a manufacturer has to compete nationally and internationally, he's got to go where he can make that product at the lowest possible cost so he can stay in business. And so they're flocking to Indiana, uh, and we're just a few adult decisions away from turning Illinois around. Workers' compensation is the number one issue. Uh, for people who don't understand workers' comp, it is a very, very expensive cost for manufacturer. It's a lot more than what they pay in taxes. It's a, it's a huge driving cost that makes manufacturers in Illinois less competitive than other states. And if we would just bring our workers' comp costs down to the average, and so what we're looking at in reforms we just want to do what 49 other states have done. Why do we want to be the only state that has these work rules that no other state, including union states, abide by? And that's the part that's frustrating that we just can't seem to get past the house. And you can't even make the argument that, well, we're going to stay where we are because it's paying off such big dividends for us. Look, you know, okay, sure, we're higher than everybody else, but look, we're reaping the benefits of all that. When, in fact, we're, we're not reaping any benefits, we're driving people away. And like you said, the, the scary thing is it's not to the Sun Belt. It's next door. Next door. It, you know, it's the shortest move they can possibly make, but find themselves in a better economic circumstance. But you hate to say these things. You start asking yourself, why are they not concerned about that many middle-class manufacturing jobs leaving Illinois? And the only logical reason, if you put those together, is they don't want... Uh, middle-class families in Illinois because middle-class families more likely vote Republican. And so if you, if you drive the middle-class out of the state, then you have a lot more voters that believe as they do. Uh, and that's the, only, that's the only possible reason we can think of why they don't want to keep manufacturing here in Illinois. Uh, they'll expand social programs. Uh, but they don't want to do anything to help with job creation. And that's what's frustrating when you realize that, you know, just a couple of these changes and we can keep and attract and bring more good paying jobs back to Illinois. And it's astounding how the thoughts of one congressional district dominate the entire state mm -hmm. because you, you, you insist on one guy going back in from your district. That guy then controls literally everything in the state. Is there a speaker in the nation that holds as much power? No, there's never been one in history. There'll be books written about uh, this. Uh, and it's just once you're in there, the way the, the way the rules are written, you just end up having a, a control because then the speaker gets to draw the maps and then the people are beholden to the person who draws the maps. And then you always, when you, when you control the maps, um, then you control the legislature. And so it's, it, it makes it interesting. And, you know, ultimately, if you want to find common ground, you can find it. If you don't want to find it, you're not going to. And so uh, we're hoping that this is, will be the year that enough pressure will be put on and people will realize that uh, this state should be bigger than Madigan or Rauner. This state should be about, you know, how do we move Illinois forward? And... Um, we're hoping next week will be the start of uh, sending a message that um, that we need to make these changes. So, but the good news is, you know, the fundamentals are there. Illinois has a great workforce. We're centrally located. We have great uh, uh, just-in-time manufacturing that can be done. So, the fundamentals are there for Illinois to really uh, turn around. Uh, and so, uh, uh, if we do this, you know, the good news is it's not going to be a a slow turnaround. It's going to be a fast turnaround. And with what Trump is doing to bring and keep manufacturing here in the United States, we want Illinois to be poised to be getting a lot of those jobs that are coming back. Yeah, to where they, they probably wouldn't consider us now. It just, you know, being looked at would be a step in the right direction, I think. Exactly. And again, 
when mag, when companies look, we're centrally located. We have a great infrastructure. Uh, you know, we've got the best airports. We have the best rail system in the world. We can move goods and services uh, everywhere. Healthcare, we've got a great healthcare. Some of the best healthcare in the nation is right here in Illinois. So all these fundamentals are in such great position. We just need to do a couple of these reforms to put Illinois back in line with other states. And there's nothing that says that we can't get back to the the greatness that Illinois was in the 50s and the 60s, where Illinois was not only one of the economic giants in the country, we were one of the economic giants in the world at that time. There's no reason why we can't get back to that. And it's and it's heartening to hear you say that you know with the right moves made, it won't be the well. It's gonna it's three decades of getting in. It's gonna be three decades of getting back out again. That turnaround could happen a whole lot quicker than that. Turn around very quick. But again, it's because we're located. You could do all the all the things that you want, but if you're in Louisiana, it's going to be awfully hard to get your goods and services to the East Coast and the West Coast. And so we're in the middle. We And for other states to build the kind of infrastructure we already have would, would take decades. And so we're just literally months away from doing things that could turn Illinois around if we can just get these guys to sit down and agree to make a few of these changes. Might be an idea to keep your eye on Springfield over the next couple of weeks and see how all of this stuff turns out. I hey, really appreciate you taking time out of your day to, uh, to come in. You, you keep in office hours. Uh, you go back down to Springfield, uh, what, over the weekend? Um, no, I'm in town this weekend. We go down uh, next week, so I get to watch football, even though uh, the Bears aren't going to be in it this no. year. But uh, Who's kind of like win? Illinois, the Bears are, re- are rebuilding. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> who wins? Uh, you know, you got the youth of Atlanta, uh, uh, but... I think, um, you know, as a guy that's getting older, I think age and experience trumps youth. And I'm so, with you. Yeah. Uh, Every year that goes by, I begin to hope and think that more. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, good to see you as always. Thank you. Great to see you.